Today we're really in for a treat because I think we spend, at least many of us, spend too little time thinking and appreciating the great importance of the community college system in what they do for higher education in the state of California. We have here two uh, terrific people, Katie Hearn and Myra Snell. Uh, one teaches uh, English at uh, Chabot, one teaches mathematics, if I can get it right, Las Madonnas. But uh, in addition to all that work, they are co-founders of this California Acceleration Project, which has won all kinds of awards. Uh, they themselves were cited as uh, Washington Monthly 2016, uh, 16 most innovative people in higher education for their work in uh, helping underprepared college students. I just looked up before I came here, roughly 13 to 15 percent of Cal Berkeley undergrads are junior college transfers. So uh, a number of them are doing great work, but you also have people who have more, uh, more hurdles to, to climb over to be prepared citizens in society. So we're very fortunate to have uh, Katie and Myra here, and they're going to tell us about the underprepared student. Welcome. So we're beginning today with a rather stark piece of data. Um, but this is part of the problem that we are working to solve in the California Acceleration Project. Katie and I co-founded the California Acceleration Project, which is a faculty-driven grassroots initiative that has its primary goal of helping students who are coming to the community college complete a very early and important momentum point, which is transferable math and English. Right? So that's our main focus, and the faculty we work with are in math, English, ESL, and reading. Um, currently, I guess I should say, too, that we have 113 community colleges in the, in Cal the California community college system, and we are the largest um, system of higher education in the United States. And Katie and I have, um, what did we decide the number was? That it, 75 about of the colleges. About 75 percent of the colleges have actually started implementing reforms that we advocate, and some have completely transformed what they're doing. But, <laughs> Uh, and we thought we would look at just some context pieces in case you're not familiar with the community college system. So most of our students are students of color, come from diverse ethnic backgrounds. Um, most of them also have the goal of transferring to UC or CSU to complete a baccalaureate. Um, the estimate is about 80 to 85 percent of students coming into the community college have that goal. But the community colleges also have a diverse mission, so we do um, also certification for various kinds of job training um, in addition to lifelong learning. Um, but if you look at the UC graduates, nearly one in three started at a community college, and at CSU it's half. So we are open access institutions, which means that those students do have to apply. There are no um, criteria. Everyone is actually has access to a community college education. And we know that if students can actually get through their first two years of lower division collegiate work at the community college and transfer in at a junior status, um, this makes a huge difference in their lifelong earning, earnings and social mobility. So this is sort of drives a lot of the work that Katie and I do. Now, even though we are open access institutions, when a student matriculates at the community college, they are um, given a placement test. And we have seven, over 70 community college districts, and each district determines how they matriculate students. So what placement tests they use, what cut scores they use, if they use other measures such as high school GPA or course taking. And based on these sort of processes, um, we sort students into those that we label as underprepared and those that we label as prepared for college. Now, if you look at the repercussions of that label, if a student is labeled as underprepared, only about 40% of them will go on to complete a community college degree or certificate or transfer to transfer preparedness status for a UC or CSU. And if they are labeled prepared, their chances are much greater of achieving those educational milestones. And then 
The sad thing is that statewide, we place more than three quarters of our incoming students into this category of underprepared. So we wanted to start talking for just a moment about a lot of times when you think about the, the large number of underprepared students in the California community college system, there's a lot of finger pointing at the high schools and sort of a claim that high schools aren't doing their job. But Katie and I want to shift that paradigm today and to really talk about what we do in the community college system that is driving the inequities that we see and the problems that we see with students not obtaining their educational goals. And the first one we're gonna look at is placement testing. So this is an, a sample item from a very popular standardized test that's used in the community college system, the AccuPlacer, it's from the sit and skills test. I'll just let you read that for a moment. And then I want you to step back <laughs> And, you know, of course, think, do I know the answer? But also, does this test the kind of skills that students really need in order to write an argumentative essay that synthesizes multiple texts, the kinds of things that we have them do in freshman comp? Is this the indicator? Well, at community college system, it is, right? Mm -hmm. These are the kinds of things that we use. All right. So if we look now at what happens in math, here we go. Now this is from the practice test for the AccuPlacer. And if you can perform these kinds of algebraic manipulations, you would be able to bypass remediation. If you cannot, at most community colleges, you would face a year of remediation before you were allowed to enroll in a course that would transfer to UC or CSU for college credit. Okay? And if you think about these skills and you think about the courses that you took to take to meet your quantitative reasoning requirements, if you're not in math and science, that was probably a course like statistics or maybe a course in liberal arts mathematics that looked at sort of survey um, quantitative reasoning skills across a, a variety of fields. And I can tell you that none of these skills are used in those courses. So the vast majority of our students who are coming to the community college are not coming in um, math intensive majors. And yet we are screening them out of access to courses that would transfer to UC or CSU based on these kind of skills. Okay. One thing, we often show this to a room full of faculty from the humanities, English faculty, ESL, and we say math people don't answer this question. And we, and we ask the room, are you college ready? <laughs> and the answer is overwhelmingly no. <laughs> and it's not, I mean, at one point in my life, I was really good at these things, and that point was high school. Um, but then, in the meaningful life I have led since then, <laughs> including two master's degrees and a doctorate, I have not been called upon to do these kinds of symbolic manipulations, and those skills atrophied immediately. Um, Placement skills should really be the skills that we think are truly prerequisite, right, to doing well in college level work. All right. Okay, so a little more on placement testing. Um, placement tests do a phenomenally poor job of identifying who will and who will not do well in college. And if you look at the correlation between AccuPlacer test scores and grades, numerical grades in college level courses, or really in any course in which they're placed, there's a very poor correlation. And if tests did a good job, we would expect to see a nice pattern, right? But that scatter plot of test scores versus course grades look like somebody sneezed on it. There is no pattern at all, right, in um, th that scatter plot. And if you actually, if you're a math person, these are R squared values. If you're not, these are percentages that if you look at the percentage of variation that you see in course grades that are actually explained by a test score, it's 1% in English. So 99% of the variation we see in course grades is actually explained by other factors than a test score. And in mathematics, it's 4%. And this is from the statewide CalPASS data looking at all students um, that took the AccuPlacer test in California and came to a community college. Um, we also know from a seminal research study um, by Judah Scott Clayton in 2012 of, a place, of the placement system at a very large urban community college system that had 42,000 students, 
that according to her modeling, severe underplacement is three times more prevalent than overplacement. And underplacement, severe underplacement, is defined by Scott Clayton to be students who were placed into remediation who could have earned a B or better in a college level course. Now, the reason that this is important is that overplacement is what's obvious to us. It's the student that you hear a faculty member complaining about in the lounge, right? I have a student enrolled in my course X who can't even do, right? And we know those students by name because there aren't very many of them. Who we really don't see, and what's in invisible to us, is the underplacement issue because these are students who are placed into remediation who, guess what, are doing really well. And they are the students that we take credit for, right, when we're teaching remedial courses because they're doing well. But actually, they don't belong there at all and could have done quite well if we had placed them into, directly into college level coursework. This last one is an estimate of the percentage of topics in the traditional Algebra 1, Algebra 2, or Elementary Intermediate Algebra courses that are taught at the community college that most students are forced through. Um, very poor alignment between those topics and the topics and concepts that students would learn in a statistics course. And the vast majority of our students are going into um, think courses like statistics to meet their lower division quantitative reasoning requirements upon transfer. All right, so. All right, so what happens once we label over three quarters of our students as underprepared based on these placement tests? What happens to them is they get placed into remediation. And what does remediation look like? At the, the traditional community college remediation sequence is three, four courses, which can take up to two years to complete. And we will remediate students in math, English, ESL, and reading. Right? And these courses don't earn degree or transfer credit. Most of them do not. And the kinds of things that go on in these courses are Things like students working through grammar workbooks, or students learning to, yet again, add fractions by hand in a decontextualized way, right? Okay. All right, and placing students into these multi-level sequences is disastrous. There is a huge amount of attrition in these pipelines. And this is statewide data from the Basic Skills Cohort Tracker, which is open and free. You can go there and look at remediation data for any community college you're interested in in California. But this is coming from math. So if a student places one level below transfer, which if you're a math person, sort of intermediate algebra, algebra two level, 35% of them will go on to complete a transfer level math course <laughs> in three years. And the lower we place them down, the fewer actually get through the pipeline. So if we're placing a student three or more levels below, which would be into arithmetic or pre-algebra kind of content, something that students would learn in fourth through seventh grade, right? if we're placing a student at that level, 94% of them will never become transfer prepared and will not transfer. And the stark thing about this is that this is a major driver of racial inequities in our system. So across California, more than half of the black and Hispanic students who are placed into remediation are placed at this level. And we should just pause there for a moment and digest that. So we're saying that if you are a student of color, black or Hispanic, who is placed into remediation, we are placing you into a structure by a bogus system, right? A placement test has very little predictive validity about your capacity, but we're putting you into a structure where 94% of you will not complete the math that's needed for transfer, okay? Really dire. All right, so we're gonna give you an example here of what inequity looks like, and we chose um, Mount San Jacinto College, and we're looking at English data right now from fall of 2015. This is very representative of what you see across the state. By the way, Mount San Jacinto has made some improvements, and this is no longer true there, and Katie's going to show you. Katie gets to do the uplifting part of the presentation today. <laughs> um, but, but this is very typical. So we um, are more likely, if you're a white student, you're more likely to be placed into college English or college math um, and Hispanics um, than Hispanics or African American students. So big racial disparity at the placement, direct placement into college level coursework. 
And your chance of passing college English at Mount San Jacinto in fall of 2005 would be 73%, right? So if you get placed at that level, you got a pretty good shot of getting through that early momentum point of completing uh, freshman comp. But what happens at the other end of the pipeline? Not surprising, American, uh, African American and Hispanic students are more than two times more likely than white students to be required to take those multiple layers of remediation. Okay? And if they are placed that low, <laughs> Um, in multiple layers of remediation, 23% to 38% would complete a freshman comp transferable English course um, in two years. Okay, so this is not, this is typical. Mm -hmm. All right, and I'm going to close with, again, some comments about equity. Um, I'm from the um, Contra Costa Community College District, Free College District, and our institutional researcher, who now happens to be the president of the research and planning group for the state of California, um, did a study trying to determine what is actually explaining the inequities that we see, the racial inequities that we see in transfer preparedness or degree completion at the community college. And so he starts backing up looking at, well, is it completion of 30 units or is it persistence into the second semester? Like, where do we really start seeing that gap occur? And what he estimated is that 50 to 60% of the racial inequities that we see in these longer term measures, degree completion and transfer readiness is explained by initial placement. Right? So it's right when they come in the door and are given those placement tests. Okay, now we're gonna move to the more uplifting part of the presentation. <laughs> okay, um, so we're gonna share with you some early data from colleges that are moving away from this um, <laughs> traditional system and working with us in the California Acceleration Project. And this is very fresh data. This is data from fall 2016, colleges that have just implemented big changes. And we want to say this is descriptive data provided by the Institutional Research Office. Now, if you're a, a kind of a critical research consumer, you say, well, we need third party or we need you know, controls to, you know, and, and we understand that. And so in the research briefs we've left on your, um, on your seats, you can see some of the broader base of research that, that is reinforcing the kinds of things that we are saying. But we wanted to give you the most recent results from colleges that are really doing ambitious things to, to transform remediation. And the, big, the biggest lever is allowing more students to bypass remedial courses altogether and just begin directly in college level courses. And they might begin in college level courses just regular courses because we've been using these placement tests in really illegitimate ways and they should have been there all along and they, they were never remedial. And we should, we should stop confusing placement into remediation with needing remediation. We need to start pulling, pulling those two ideas apart. But the other approach would be to say, we're going to allow you into a college level course, but we're concerned you might struggle, so we'll provide additional concurrent support. But we're not going to block you from the course and make you take layers of courses where you become progressively less likely to complete your goals. So I want to just give you a window from a student's perspective. This is Andre Salazar. He is a student at College of the Canyons down in Southern California, north of Los Angeles. And he was assigned by the placement test to two years of remediation. He was, he was going to have to start in an arithmetic course that refused content from grades four through six math. What that meant for his likelihood of completing a transferable math course in three years is that it was about 12%. And if you want to see this, this is data from the college from the basic skills cohort tracker. In fall 2013 at the college, 315, 353 students started in that arithmetic course at the college. And three years later, 43% of them, 43, 43 human beings had completed a transferable math course. But here are some other things we know about Andres. His goal is to complete a bachelor's degree in music consulting. So it's not a calculus-based major. His high school math background was he earned an A in Algebra two. His high school GPA was a 4.0. So he was allowed to enroll directly into college statistics based on this high school background, which was quite strong, instead of relying on the standardized placement test, which we know is not a good indicator of student capacity. And what happened there? He earned an A because he always earned an A. <laughs> and he was able to complete a trans his transferable math requirements in one semester instead of five semesters. 
this is what his college, College of the Canyons, has done that's transformative. So they're starting to use high school grades for math placement instead of relying upon these standardized tests. Um, students qualify for statistics through the test or self-reported high school measures, including their GPA and their grades and their prior math coursework. Uh, and self-reported is key because we are not requiring them to bring in a transcript or get, get approval from somebody or have data sharing between the high school and the colleges. They had looked at their institutional data and found that when we ask students to self-report, they self-report accurately. So we can just rely on that and make our process simpler. Um, this is for fall 2016. By what, this one move, eligibility for college statistics more than quadrupled at the college, increasing from 15% of incoming students to 71% of incoming students. Massive increase in access to college level transferable math courses. And lo and behold, success rates in the course remain steady. Even though they quadrupled the proportion of incoming students who could get into the course, it didn't lead to widespread failure, which is what I think faculty tend to expect that, oh, if you let all these students in, they're going to flame out, there's going to be widespread failure, the class is going to become completely impossible to teach. Well, that didn't happen because we had been underestimating them all along. And for students who started in statistics but previously would have been placed into remediation, 66% succeeded on their first attempt. And if they would have previously been in that arithmetic course, they passed at a rate of 57% on their first attempt. That's like the, the group we would call the lowest group. Um, and this completion of a transferable math course was five times higher than among students who started in remediation just one year before at the college. So 66% in one semester versus 13% in a year previously. Katie, I wonder, too, we want to emphasize that College of the Canyons, they did not change their pedagogy, they did not change their curriculum, they did not change the rigor of the college level statistics course. It was the same course that had already been articulated with the UC system. They did not CSU. add a bunch of wraparound supports or counseling or all, they just let the students in to the existing rigorous college level course and the students showed they were up to the challenge. Okay, next example. Here's Alex Arguello from Solano College. His goal is a degree in fire technology. He wants to be a fire marshal. His high school background was not as strong as Andres Salazar's. He was a C&D student, and he was on the verge of not being able to graduate with his class and had to do five months of Saturday school to catch up his units and graduate. And he was having a lot of personal difficulties in high school, which he had capacity, but he was skipping school a lot. That was the source of his, his low performance. His initial course placement at Solano was three levels below college English, which was largely focused on grammar. This is the kind of class where the textbook that you have, the subheading is from the sentence to the paragraph. <laughs> I think that's, the, that's what students are focusing on in that low, low level of class. And he found it too easy, but he passed. And luckily he had a student, he had a teacher who saw his capacity and said, we have this new course at Solano where you can enroll directly in college level English, but get extra support there. Three hours of extra instruction with the teacher um, to help you meet the higher level outcomes. And he enrolled in that. His grade in that class was a B. And then he went on to the next college composition class, the second transferable course, and earned an A. So what Solano did is what increasingly community colleges are moving toward in California is, is this, this thing we call co-requisite remediation, where we say, we're going to allow you, we're, we're a little concerned about what we're seeing in terms of your preparedness, but we're going to allow you to enroll up into the college level course and just require you to have ad additional support there. So students who don't qualify for regular college English can enroll in sections that have three additional hours with the instructor. And they can qualify for this through either their test score or self-reported high school measures like, like College of the Canyons did. And this change increased eligibility for College English from 18% to over 80% at the college. So now the vast majority of students, instead of being required to take remedial courses, are now allowed to start in college level courses in English. And what happened when they did that? 
Of course, success rates held steady. <laughs> they, again, we did not see a sort of a skyrocketing of failure due to this influx of the unwashed hordes of unprepared. In fact, the students were capable. Uh, students who previously would have had to be in remedial courses were in the English with, with concurrent support. 65% of them succeeded in, in the course, which was comparable to students who officially qualified for the regular college level course. And this completion rate of college English was twice that of students who started in English remediation a year earlier. Um, that's, yes, 65% in one semester versus 31% in one year. Okay. The concurrent support models are being used in both English and math, and so I'm going to give you an example from somebody who is in a STEM, a STEM field. So this is Carly Franz from Cuyamaca College in the San Diego region. She wants to be a high school biology teacher, and we need those in California. We need good high school biology teachers, so we want to support her to reach her goals. She was a returning adult. She'd been away from math for five years and studied fashion design and worked as a historical costumer. And her initial course placement by, through the, the placement test was intermediate algebra. So that's one level below a transferable math course. She was allowed to enroll directly in a pre-calculus course instead of intermediate algebra. The, and the, the course just had two additional units of support with the instructor. So that, that would provide just-in-time review of the concepts that are required in the course and sort of more space to practice and get, get guidance from the instructor. Um, and she, her grade in pre-calculus was an average of 89. So what Cuyamaca has done is the most large-scale transformation in the community college system in California on the math side. So I want to sort of pause and give you a window into that. Most, most community colleges that are working with CAP, and we're working with over three quarters of them, most of them are making incremental change. You know, we sort of we, we hook a few faculty in and they feel like, oh, we need to do this on our campus. And then they fight a battle in their department <laughs> to, get a sex, to get some sections on the books. And it usually is a small number of sections. And the proportion of students reached is pretty small. And most students are trapped in the existing system. Cuyamaca went all in on this in fall 2016. Um, so here's what they did. So they use high school grades to place students into five pathways because you know the math you take at the college level is different depending on what you want to study. The math for engineers is different than the math for English majors. Oops. Um, they, they do concurrent support models for all of the first tier college level courses. So that's you know allowing students to enroll up into the college level course, but making them take an additional two or three unit course that's, that's hard linked to the class, that builds out the time and, and practice available inside the classroom environment, taught by the same teacher. Now, under these transformations, 84% of their incoming students are eligible for statistics, either regular or with the concurrent support. That's up from, I believe, 24% last year. And 59% are eligible for a transferable business or STEM math course, regular or with support. And the student's worst possible scenario in placement is a single course that doesn't count toward the bachelor's degree. So if they're going to go into a business or STEM pathway where they need to take calculus and they're not hitting the, the placement criteria, then they would be required to enroll in intermediate algebra with extra support. Okay. So here's what they did. What, what did it do to placement? So this table, what you're going to see is um, access to transferable college level math course under the old system, 2015, and the new system in 2016. So you can see that, that for everyone, placement into transfer level math went from 24% to 84%. But some groups had phenomenal gains. So African American students went from 9% to 73%. Eight times higher placement into transfer level math. Now you can still see there's, there's a little bit of difference between the groups. So Asian students had 90% placement in transfer level compared to African American 73. But they're much closer together. The, the disparities between groups have really shrunk with just this one move uh, in how they changed placement. And then the question that we need to ask is, well, you placed them there. How did they do? <laughs> did, they, did they pass? What did the pass rates look like inside these transferable courses with support? 
So I want to just explain the, the chart a little bit. In the left is, on the, the left-hand column, placement into the traditional sequence. This is where they would have been based on their test scores under the old structure. So there, there are no students now who are placed three or more levels below at Cuyamaca. That doesn't exist anymore. There are no students placed two levels below at Cuyamaca. It doesn't exist anymore. But we're giving you that so that you can have a comparison of where would the students have been and how did they do in the transfer level math course they were allowed to enroll in. And what I find spectacular about this is how little difference there is between these groups. That students who would have placed one level below under the old system had a 69% pass rate in the transfer level course. Students who would have placed three or four levels below had a 62% pass rate in the transferable course. So you, I mean, you can see in that data how little meaningful information we were getting about students' capacity based on our placement test. And then the thing I also love about this table is on the right, you see how did students who started with those placements do in the traditional sequence in two years? So you're seeing one semester data compared to two year data. And these, under these new models, it's blowing the traditional out of the water. You know, so for students who would have started three or more levels below a transfer of math course, their, their completion of transfer level math in two years had been 4%. And now that group has a 62% completion. And overall, for all levels, it went from 40% in two years to 67% in two years. So one thing I want to point out, when, we, when we're talking with faculty about this, there's often a concern that somehow some students will be left behind. When we say, you have to accelerate remediation, we have to restructure, we have to stop doing what we've been doing, they'll say, no, but not for all students. There are some students that really need a slower path. And they are thinking of the ones who would be three or more levels below. And, but you can see, if when you look at the comparison data, that these are the students who have the biggest gains. These are the ones who stand to benefit the most from us really transforming the structures we put them into. Okay, I want to just add that we are essentially, it might be surprising to say this, a professional development organization. So we work with faculty on implementing these structural changes first and really rethinking the way they're doing placement, rethinking the structures of remediation. But Kuyamaka is, was one of the first colleges we worked with, and they really have transformed the math classroom. So they are using um, activity-based learning, project-based learning. Um, it's very interactive. Students do a lot of presentations. So I think that that is one college that has sort of taken all parts of what we offer, not only the structural changes, but also the work that we do with faculty on pedagogy. Mm -hmm. And we call them our cliff jumpers. Like they just, they go. They don't, incre they don't do incremental. They really just go and transform. And they become a vision for the rest of the state about what is possible. Um, so if we have 100, and, we have one college doing this out of 113. 112 need to <laughs> be paying attention to this. Yes? You know, in the community college system, um, it really varies. Class size really varies. And they did not change their class size. So they have around 40 students in a section. OK. So the, I, I want to also, so Cuyamaca inside California community colleges is providing a vision of the possible in math for the rest of us. And the state of Tennessee is providing a vision of the possible for California <laughs> as a state. So Tennessee is a centralized, has a centralized higher education system that is governed by one board, Tennessee Board of Regents. Um, and, and they looked at the data. This, this data on remediation is, you know, there's been really deep work for the last 10 years. And, and several years back, they looked at their current system and said, we're not doing this anymore. This is not working. This is not serving our students. It's not living up to our mission. We're going to change what we do statewide. And the change they made was to stop offering traditional remedial courses at all public colleges and universities. So no student who is admitted to a college or a university in Tennessee is going to be placed into a standalone remedial course. Um, if they're flagged as not college prepared by whatever placement mechanism they're using, 
Uh, then they enroll in college. They do co-requisite remediation. They enroll up into the college level course, but they have to have extra support attached. And here's what happened when they did that statewide across all institutions, all sections. Completion of college math in one year quadrupled statewide and completion of college English doubled statewide. And I think this is really important data to hold in context if you're thinking, well, we're not really sure. We need statistical modeling to know about teacher effect. Or, you know, we're not, this, the students from this high school are, got better than these high schools, so we're not sure if we can trust GPA. I mean, all those questions that usually come at us when we're sharing data from colleges that are doing something ambitious, People want to sort of write it off and say, no, there are other explanations for these gains that you're seeing at Cuyamaca or at Chabot or whatever we're sharing. And we'll say, well, what about Tennessee, though? <laughs> Good teachers, bad teachers, great high schools, weak high schools. The entire state switched from this structure to this structure. And in, one, and in you know, the, the comparison is a couple of years later, but basically, this, Tennessee student population has not changed dramatically during that time. And this is what was possible when they made these structural changes. Okay, so that brings us to where we are as a state in California. We have 113 community colleges and they are all determining their remediation policies locally. So what has meant for our work in CAP is we have been traveling evangelists for seven years. We have been trying to recruit faculty, to make change locally, to get sections on the ground, to study their data, to share it back. Like, it's all been a completely grassroots mobilization effort. And we have not been completely successful because there are, there's no college that hasn't, where somebody hasn't been exposed to our arguments. There's zero colleges that haven't been exposed. But there are colleges where the math department will just cross its arms and say, we're not doing that. We, we don't like that. We think, we think all students need really detailed algebra instruction, regardless of their major. So we're not doing that. And we say, well, okay. And their colleagues who want them to do it, on behalf of their, we have colleges where English faculty have done really transformative work and their math faculty are completely unwilling to engage and we have no policy levers or administrative levers for affecting that. So we have amazing results at a few colleges. I just shared that with you. But most students in this state are still st stuck in the remedial system we started with, the problem problematic system that we described at the beginning. And then we also have an obstacle on the math side is that transfer policies at UC and CSU are impeding change in math. Uh, where if faculty set a prerequisite for a college level math course that will transfer, then that sort of makes community colleges feel like they have to test students on all of those itemized skills inside that content and it sort of locks us into the traditional structure. So if you put, and you know, as used to be at UC, but you've, you've changed this, thank you for this. They, statistics used to have intermediate algebra as a prerequisite and so that includes all of those topics from intermediate, not only intermediate algebra, but elementary algebra and pre-algebra, because it's got this, that one prerequisite has this long arm <laughs> that forces us to impose a structure that, where we lose all of our students, and especially our students of color. So you've changed that in stats. You, you, you defined actual prerequisite skills and, and put those in place on the statistics course, which has allowed us more freedom to redesign remediation for our students. CSU, we're still sort of struggling with that. And then, so this is our closing slide. This is where we feel like we are in California. I wanna invite you into this conversation with us. Is that right now in California, as you could see from the student stories we gave you, there is vast underplacement across our system where student, capable students are being placed into remediation who do not need it. And what that does is make them less likely to complete a degree and also exacerbates racial inequity. The existing student protections that we have in the community college system are not being followed. So under Title V, which is our, the regulations for our system, we're not supposed to block a student from a course and require a prerequisite un unless that student is highly unlikely to be successful in the course. But we are not following that at all. We only really allow in the ones who are highly likely. 
we're also not supposed to have such big racial inequities in our assessment practices where, where white students could have two to four times the access to a college level cl class than African American and Hispanic students, but at colleges we're working with, it's incredibly common. And if a college doesn't have inequities, it's usually because they let so few students into the transfer level course that everyone is equally screwed. So if they let 1% of students start in transfer level math, there's not gonna be a disproportionate impact on students of color. <laughs> Um, but at, at, at overwhelmingly at our institutions, we, we are violating the guidelines we're supposed to have around disproportionate impact. Few California colleges are offering co-requisite models of remediation despite very strong results nationally. And there is a new legislation that's just been introduced this season by Jackie Irwin, Assemblymember Jackie Irwin, called AB705 that we would encourage you to check out. This is attempting to address the problems that we've um, we've discussed in this solution and, and feels like a promising step toward, toward grappling with these. So we wanna open it up for questions. Okay, yes. Hi, uh, this is really oh, fascinating. Oh yeah, here I'll wait. <laughs> Thank you, Diana. Uh, so this is a, this is really fascinating work for a bunch of reasons. So first off, thank you for coming to tell us about it. Um, can you say a little bit about what the extra support looks like? Uh, you know, who does it? Is that something done through the community college? Do you have your own network? Is it volunteer based? What, how does that work? It's the teacher. It's more class time with the teacher. So it's the instructor of the class, instead of teaching a three unit college English college composition class, has five units with these students. Um, and, if, and, and the college could locally determine, you know, we have a really good tutoring program, so we want to embed a tutor in, or we have a, a relationship with this grad program down the road, so we're going to have grad assistance in there. Solana College has that. But, but fundamentally, the model is you let them into, you just, they have to re enroll in a higher unit value class, a five unit class, and it's one coherent experience. And, and is, is that way of doing it, uh, is that by design, yeah. or is that just that that sort of happened to be a way to bootstrap the program, get it off the ground, but mm -hmm. you'd be open to... I, I'm wondering if there's other possible arrangements where the extra support could come in a form that doesn't necessarily tax the community college resources, or whether that's something that they, that they consider. You know, the ones who have been resistant, is this one of the reasons that they're resistant? They don't feel like their existing teachers have the resources to do more. No, that's, that's not okay. why they're that's resistant. No. Okay. I will say in Tennessee, though, that state has not mandated one model of co-requisite reform. So if you look across the state of Tennessee in math, they're all doing very different things for co-requisite um, support. So, you know, I think, but here in California, it's not very widespread, and Katie and I have an opinion about <laughs> what we're encouraging colleges to do, which is really to have um, more processing time with your instructor as opposed to um, going to a lab that's detached or working with a support staff who may or may not be tracking the big ideas in the course that you're teaching, that kind of thing. And we've also tried not to have the support look like decontextualized skill building. So we really are contextualizing skill building within the course that they're taking. So in English, for example, if you're working on grammar, it's in the context of writing the paper right, that, that you need to write. In mathematics, if, if you're in a statistics course and you need to brush up on your percentages, it's in the context of analyzing um, conditional probabilities. So it, it's, it's, we try to embed the remediation in a just-in-time way, in a contextualized way, and the easiest way to do that is by having the same instructor responsible for it. Pam. Um, so wait, wait for the mic. I have a few questions. I'll, I'll save the others for later, but um, just about the UC and CSU policies. So you mentioned that UC has um, reformed their policy around prerequisites for statistics and that CSU has not. Yeah. So I just thought it might be interesting for this group to think about how helpful is it if UC has made the change and CSU has not? Are you really able to implement that very much no. in that situation? We have two masters then. And they have different, and, and the CSU is holding itself to a quote unquote more rigorous standard than the UC. Um, yeah, it's not, it, it's blocking colleges from implementing these reforms. So we, I'm gonna, I'm going to leave the college name out, but we had one college that was poised to launch 20 sections of a redesigned pre-statistics course with us. And that's a huge scale up. And the faculty, how much work had gone into building departmental support for that and doing trainings for that and getting it on the books. 
And then because of sort of uncertainties about CSU and whether they would honor that kind of course as a prerequisite for statistics, they've, that's been canceled. That was just canceled this in the last month. So it's, you know, this policy gray area that we're in with CSU where they're sort of saying, yeah, you can do these, but then signaling, no, you can't. Um, I wanted to emphasize, too, that the policy issues are not around the course that we are articulating with our four-year partners. We're not having any problems with the content of those courses or the learning goals around those courses. Those have long-standing articulation agreements. What the problem is, is that, and I would, and I would say a little bit about UC, but CSU, for instance, is really wanting to control the way that we're preparing students for the course in which they give credit. So they're wanting to dictate to us and do dictate to us through their policies what remediation needs to look like and we know what it looks like and we know how badly it's failing. So the one thing I think that you see, we need from you see actually is permission to do co-requisite remediation. In our mathematics courses that articulate with the UC system, they have to have stated prerequisites and so this is interpreted by the community colleges that we have to have a structure of you do your remediation first and then you're eligible to go into college level work as opposed to letting those things happen in this just in time integrated contextualized way. So I think that is one thing that we actually in mathematics need from the UC system is a permission to um, begin to innovate around co-requisite remediation. Mm -hmm. And we've been sort of saying all along if, we're, if, if our students are meeting the agreed upon outcomes for the course you're actually giving credit for, why do you care? <laughs> like, let us handle the remediation. Why do you need to dictate up like four layers of coursework down from that course? Like just let's have an agreement about what the standards of the course you give credit for and, and then create greater flexibility for us to design remediation practices that will enable our students to be successful with, without compromising standards. That's, that's what we need. There were some other hands. Mm -hmm. Hi. Um, how do these changes affect workload issues? Because you said that you're not, the colleges who've implemented these uh, changes are not making more sections available. So what happens to the faculty who teach, who were teaching remedial courses? Do they lose their jobs or? Mm -hmm. Do they, are they moved into a, a regular college level course that's taught by someone else? It's handled differently at, because all of the community colleges are governed locally and so they have different policies around this. But um, in mathematics, we have not had that problem. So we have been able, to, a couple of colleges do have basic, separate basic skills programs, um, but we have been able to do interdisciplinary work with that program and the, you know, other math part department programs. So we really have in mathematics not had that problem. And basically what happens is instead of teaching, you know, in my college it used to be 70% of our mathematics offerings were remedial, right? Now that is only about 30% of our offerings. So all of those teachers who were teaching remediation now get to teach courses that they frankly would rather teach, right? That are higher up in the pipeline. But English is a little different. And the one, the one challenge in math, too, is that they need to expand their sections of statistics because that's actually the math that most of their students need, even though they really think everybody should be STEM. They are not and still can lead meaningful lives. Um, so it, it does require a little bit of sort of front end um, helping people who are more traditionally math trained to be able to teach statistics. And so we've been supporting that work. In English, it really, for the most part, it's just a reallocation of sections. So it, just like in math, you, you have, instead of all these layers of remediation where we're losing all our students, we're teaching college level courses and we're adding, we're adding sections even in the second semester comp or even at some colleges in the literature elective Actives, because we haven't sort of burned through them in these like <laughs> demeaning lower level remedial courses. They stick around and actually want to take an English literature class. Um, so the, the, one, the one trick though is um, people who are certified only to teach reading, then that sort of they want to protect remedial reading courses because that's sort of their domain and we are trying to work with how can we work with equivalencies or cross training as a way so that we don't have that that as a barrier to change. So in, in English, we really do work on integrated reading and writing, yeah. so the courses are integrated, those two strands. Okay, uh, I have two questions. Are students, high school students, beginning to be clued into 
uh, the uh, opportunities that some community colleges are offering and therefore shop around. The that, savvy ones do. The savvy ones do, <laughs> yeah. Uh, I would think that that word would spread at mm -hmm. some point, uh, although I know a lot of the community colleges, students go to their local college. Uh, my second question is, is anybody looking at this also for high school? You know, why are we requiring our kids to have algebra, geometry, trigonometry to graduate from high school? I will say that the work that's being done there is in the senior year, and it's primarily targeted at students who have not finished their A through G requirements for transfer, have not gotten into pre-calculus and calculus. And we have, but it's very small scale, so we have some dual enrollment um, things going on where high schools um, are in the senior year teaching um, a course that would allow students to bypass remediation at the local community college kind of thing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Patrick, and then... Um I got a short one and a little longer one. Um, the short one is... is um, are English and language arts faculty been more receptive than math faculty in general? It sounded like. The short but answer I guess, is yes. There's, I guess there's some topical. Four times as receptive. Okay, yeah. and yes. um, I can. I, and as a, you numbers it's, on and it's yes. really because of these policy issues. Math faculty are terrified of making mm. changes that would affect the ability of our courses to count for transfer credit. Right, and the longer one is, um, I guess the proof in the pudding would be what happens when they hit CSU, UC, or um, labor market outcomes for some of the two-year graduates. Um, any future work on that mm -hmm. um, planned? And well, we do have an upcoming research study that we're negotiating with PPIC, um, very reputable group, that will be looking at the impact of co-requisite remediation at the very small scale that it currently is in the state with the goal of building a case mm -hmm. for trying to get more of that happening. Um, a lot of these changes are and have been recent enough and small scale enough that it, it hasn't really been possible to track those kinds of long-term outcomes. But my own college has a accelerated one you know pre-college course that instead of having to take two courses in remedial English, we only make students take one. And the Community College Research Center out of Columbia studied long-term outcomes from that and found that students who were accelerated had higher graduation and transfer rates than students who took the longer remedial path. So there's a little bit of evidence around there, but for the most part, these changes are new enough that we haven't done that kind of longitudinal. I think it's also possible that there's also less debt and more Cal Grant eligibility if they could continue without, since they're not attriting yeah, right that's a big issue. Yes. I think um, right here, your hand was up. Um. I have one thought about the math remediation program, and that's I've slowly begun to realize that college level math and science, chemistry, all these disciplines are basically nonverbal visual disciplines and, and really re rest on visual imagination. But yet the remedial courses that you've described are basically arithmetic and algebra, which I strongly suspect yeah. are basically e using the verbal parts of our brain. Mm -hmm. So it looks as if our, uh, these remedial courses actually lock students into verbal uh, thinking courses, which have no relevance to the math, to the visual nonverbal math that they're eventually required to take. Right. And it really looks like they're Barking, fundamentally barking up the wrong tree. Yes, yeah. sing it, yeah. yes. Yeah. Um, I just, um, this is a simple question, I think, but when you're showing the course completion rates, I'm asking this because I have seen community college course completion rates and I've seen like UC Berkeley course completion rates. Yes. Um, people here might not realize those are good. Well, the, the, yeah. Those numbers are good for the <laughs> Those are good for our system. context. Yeah. I think Those the average course context. completion rate is 60% for yeah. community college course. Is that right? Yeah. And it's not because our students aren't capable. It's because they typically are poor and juggling a lot of things. There's a lot of forces that are pulling our students away from school that are not about their ability to do the course. And so... Um, that's, you know, for, for us to have a, you know, a, a course success rate over 70% is a pretty solid, respectable um, pass rate that would be completely alien in an environment like UC. 
So we just also say that these were um, no repeat one semester success yeah. rates. So you can probably add about eight percentage points to that to see what happens after a, another semester or two. Right. So you know you, you edge up into the low seventy percent. Yeah. Other questions? Yes. Over here. Yeah, thank you very much. A great uh, presentation and very interesting. Uh, this has huge implications, obviously, for the pipeline. Uh, if I remember my statistics correctly, only about 19% of uh, students who enter community colleges end up getting an a a a AA degree. Uh, and then the percentage actually going on to CSU or UC is low. I mean, we still have about 25% or so of the students in, at Cal our transfer students, so this has a big implication. You know, one thing it would seem like we could do is maybe there could be a few campuses of UC and, I don't know, maybe CSU, but we have great data now analysis. I, I'm gonna plug, we have this, uh, uh, through this uh, uh, um, survey we do of students uh, and looking at their behaviors, but obviously we could look at basic data about how they do at Cal or at say UCLA and go on. So it seems even though that's a long haul, it seems like some kind of linking with UC to add momentum and say, well, let's do a cohort and try to understand what the implications are once they leave the community colleges. So just a thought on that. Yeah, yeah, thank you. So, I think the what I hear is there's, and having been at the community college system for a long time, there's a huge amount of apparatus and investment in this infrastructure in the industry of basic skills, both locally, but you have software that's sold to community colleges to do self-paced learning. You do have facilities that are completely devoted to this. You have advisors, you have placement people whose entire job is to do placement tests. So it's all that apparatus at 113 different areas that have to be broken down at a certain point, it's been grassroots. And if it becomes more of a top down approach, how would you manage that since you have been so faculty focused and, and, and grassroots focused? How would we manage I feel, yeah, <laughs> I would just feel tremendous relief we, we and have, have to travel less. For one you know, day. Yeah, it's like uh, at this point, yeah. I mean, I think we've proved, I think if that happened first, like at some states where they begin top down, that's a problem. It creates a big backlash. But at this point, we have a body of faculty throughout the entire system that it really owns and is invested in these kinds of changes. And it would, it would make it their lives easier to say the system is behind you, the data is clear, with this is the direction we need to move in, and it, I, I think it would be helpful at this point. Yeah. I think this last comment about essentially the vested interests to sustain the current system, irrespective of what the data shows in terms of its effectiveness. You know, this is not only true in higher education, it's in true in many fields. Yeah. So it's a huge, huge barrier, but you're doing uh, God's work and she's very happy. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs>